welcome to the History for Atheists video channel. I'm Tim O'Neill, the author of the History for Atheists blog. And today, in the channel's very first interview, I'm having a conversation with Cambridge University historian of science, Dr. Seb Falk. Seb is the author of The Light Ages, A Medieval Journey of Discovery, an entertaining and fascinating account of science in the Middle Ages. His book was released to great acclaim last year, and I must say it was the history book I most enjoyed reading in 2020. I'll put some links in this video's description so you can learn more about Seb's research and buy his excellent book. But for now, sit back and enjoy a great conversation with a very personable and interesting historian. And make sure you watch to the end where you can enjoy an eminent Cambridge historian's stirring rendition of a great sea shanty. Seb Falk, welcome to History for Atheists, and thank you very much for uh, for coming on and, uh, and for having a talk to us about your excellent book, The Light Ages, which uh, I'm, I'm an unreserved fan of your book, and I think you've probably picked that up already, but welcome to the channel, and, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. No problem. Um, so I suppose maybe just to get us started, Seb, I'd be interested in, in how you got interested in the history of science and, and medicine. Uh, I first came across you when I came across an article you wrote on John Gower, uh, who I wrote my master's thesis on many, many years mm -hmm. ago. And But then I discovered that, that you and I had a, a shared love of, of uh, the history of medieval science. So we, we're kind of on parallel tracks. How did you get into, into that topic? John Gower was a bit of a branch out for me, actually. I, I was a medieval historian to begin with. I did medieval history mainly in my undergraduate degree at Oxford. And then I became, via the civil service, I became a history teacher. And although I was always interested in science, I had no idea that there was such a thing as history of science. I didn't know that it existed as a subject at all. I've never taken any courses in it, but I was teaching history. And then I was teaching history in a school in Canada where they taught the International Baccalaureate, which is a kind of international uh, school course. And one of the courses they asked me to teach was theory of knowledge, which is a kind of very basic Sort of epistemology critical thinking course um, and I had no background in philosophy but I was kind of mugging up for it and one of the um, foundations of the course is that there are a kind of limited number of defined ways of knowing which epistemologists from the word go are like well, you can't start the course by defining ways of knowing but okay um, and one of the ways of knowing was scientific learning scientific knowledge and so I was required to teach the students about the scientific method in air quotes, scare quotes, um, which is immediately problematic because it, it kind of leads you down this road to a sort of naive scientism where scientists go out and observe the world and form hypotheses and test their hypotheses. And, and it kind of makes you, it lends itself to this idea that scientists are constantly trying to shoot down their own theories and falsify them in order to improve them, which is not what your average scientist does day to day. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of interesting to me from that point of view and it the questions that my students asked I was uh, very fortunate to have some extremely bright students um, really made me want to find out more about this subject and when I came back to the UK from Canada and I thought this is a good opportunity to take a break from teaching and do a master's I chose uh, history and philosophy of science which is a joint course in a lot of universities in the UK uh, and Cambridge is one of the best places to do it there's a very thriving and, and rich and, and um, kind of very sociable department. And so I started doing history and philosophy of science. Uh, and then I realized that I was useless at philosophy and I couldn't cope with it. And the pace of the course was such that I was never gonna catch up in time to get a decent grade in my master's. So I kind of stuck to history, slightly to my regret. Um, but having been a medievalist first and then got interested in philosophy of science, I realized that there were just massive gaps in the way that um, the history of science deals with the Middle Ages um, and, that the, and that medieval science has a way to catch up, I think, with some of the um, theoretical advances that, that modern history of science has made in terms of understanding how the ideas which were used to be the focus of history of science used to, the focus of history of science used to be so much on these kind of disembodied ideas and how these disembodied ideas coalesced and formed and evolved to become the great ideas of today's science and it's very much a kind of teleological narrative and what we need to do is step back from that a little bit 
and look at the people that made science and the societies that gave rise to science and how science took place within its social contexts. And that's something that um, hasn't been done as much for, for the Middle Ages as for later periods. And it's something that I felt um, I could contribute to. Gotcha. And that, and that uh, led, I suppose, to, to uh, you, you writing The Light Ages, which is really trying to do that for a, a popular audience. And I think it does it very successfully. One of the things I'm, I'm constantly countering um, through History for Atheists is that teleological view of the history of science, that, that it's this sort of Whiggish idea that, that everything is leading to, to us. We are right and good, and anything that leads to us is also right and good, and anything that, that wasn't leading that way was bad. Um, we might get back to that a little later in the conversation. But uh, could you describe the book? How, how would you summarise? I'm sure you've done this a few times now. How would you summarise the Light Ages? Yeah, so it's uh, a, a fairly wide-ranging history of medieval science, but focused on a particular individual and a particular story in order to make it come alive for a general audience. So my PhD work was on late medieval astronomy, and that's very much at the core of the book. Um, but I wanted to kind of stretch it out a little bit from that to show how science fitted into everyday life in the Middle Ages. So I guess my book does two things, really. It puts science back into histories of the Middle Ages, which are so dominated by politics and wars and plague. Of course, plague has a link to science through medicine, but so much of the history that I learned at school and at university was focused on politics and dynastic rivalries and, and wars and so on. And I had no idea that, that there was any science happening. I had no idea that people were looking up at the stars and trying to measure the positions of the planets and so on. So I'm trying to put science back into those histories, which are very popular, uh, at least in this country, um, but which uh, often ignore the fact that people are asking questions about nature and, and how things work. And the other thing, of course, I'm trying to put the Middle Ages back into the long history of science, because for so long, people thought that the Middle Ages were a dark age, a time when the church stifled science, a time when everybody thought the world was flat. Uh, and it's just nonsense. And, and historians have known this for a long, long time, but the general public haven't caught on. And that's why I wrote my book for a general audience, because I felt the gap. I mean, I think a lot of historians think this about their period, but I really felt that the gap between what historians know about my period and what the general public know about my period is particularly wide. And so I wanted to uh, try and help close that a little bit. My book, I'd say mainly out of those two things, putting science into the Middle Ages and putting the Middle Ages into the long history of science. I'd say my book does the first one more than the second one, mainly partly because other books have quite successfully put the Middle Ages into the long history of science, uh, but mainly perhaps because I'm quite wary of these long views of history of science, because they almost inevitably become teleological, because yeah. what is science changes so much over time. So if we're constrained by our present definition of science, then um, we inevitably start looking at the Middle Ages and only looking for the things that look like what we do today. And I really wanted to try and treat you know, alchemy and astrology um, as, as people in the Middle Ages did, as kind of equal parts of what they were doing along with mathematical, geometrical astronomy and, um, you know, timekeeping or, or other things that we might value. Yeah, and that was so, one of the things. Sorry. Sorry. Well, oh. so, so really what I, the way that I kind of wanted to go about that was to put people in the shoes of people in the Middle Ages. Um, so I think some books uh, written for a general audience kind of gloss over the content of the science because they don't want to bore their readers. And I thought that I would kind of push my readers a little bit harder than some books do. So that instead of telling them that people in the Middle Ages were really advanced, I wanted to show them, I wanted them to see for themselves. And so a really important part of the book was teaching people how to do science as people did it in the Middle Ages so that people could experience it for themselves. So in the book, you learn how to use an astrolabe, you learn how to multiply using Roman numerals, you learn some of the medical techniques, uh, you know, how to cure dysentery using, you know, rose water and so on. So some of it is stuff that we would say today is wrong, but by understanding the techniques, you start to understand a little bit about why it made sense for people in the Middle Ages. And, yeah. and that's really the core of what I was trying to achieve, was to make medieval science 
comprehensible in the broadest sense uh, to readers. And I think that was the thing I loved about your book um, because I've read other many many other books on on, uh, on medieval science, um, you know, books by by uh, numbers by by Edward Grant, um, and and in the popular area, you know, there's James Hannum's book of philosophers, mm-hmm. God's philosophers, which is an excellent book, but I think it does something quite different to to yours, and uh, I think James would probably agree. Uh, that, that they're, they're probably complementary in many ways. But the thing I loved about your book was that, it, it yes, it did do that. It made me uh, really understand, and this is someone who's been studying the, the subject for 30 years, the, the depth of their understanding of, of what they were doing, even though some of what they were doing was things that we now find a little bit odd, like alchemy and, and so on. Um, and I, I've got my astrolabe here, so by <laughs> Here's one I prepared. Oh, there we are. Yeah, yeah. And I taught myself how to use an astrolabe largely by puzzling my way through Chaucer's treatise in the original. Very good way. Yeah. And that was that was hard work. And I wish I had your book back back then (laughs) because you made it very very clear. So congratulations on that. And this is one of the reasons why I'm recommending your book to everyone who will listen. Um, So what's the reaction to the book been overall? I generally people have been extremely kind um, and I think they've kind of got what I was trying to achieve in the book. I think possibly historians more than uh, more than scientists, because I think I, I am a historian and I think some scientists would rather that I perhaps played into these kind of ideas of the long history of science. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, but generally people have been extremely kind where people have picked up on things that they didn't like. Some people have said that it's too technical and that I, I, spent too much time talking about the mathematics and too much time talking about the astronomy. And in a way, I don't mind that so much because on the one hand, my absolute priority is to write a book that is enjoyable because if it's not enjoyable, then you won't read it. And if you don't read it, then none of the rest of it succeeds at all. So it has to be first and foremost enjoyable. So I don't want to put people off. But on the other hand, there are a couple of places in the book where I say, you know, if this is really difficult, if this is really technical, then that actually shows how advanced this stuff was. Yes. how complex science was in the Middle Ages. And you shouldn't be dissing people in the Middle Ages and calling them stupid because they could manage this stuff. So why can't you? So mm-hmm. there's an element. And that's kind of part of the point of the book, right, which is to show how complex science was in the Middle Ages. In order to do that, I had to kind of take people to the brink of, of you know, really not understanding what's going on and then just hopefully draw them back. You know, sometimes I would have a couple of pages of quite complex content and then, you know, go back to some interesting stories about monks dying on the toilet or, um, <laughs> you know, people going sailing with their dog and, and that kind of thing, just to lighten it up a little bit and, yeah. you know, leaven the complex science. So, yeah, some people have said it's a bit technical. The other criticisms um, that I would say are fair, perhaps, are that it concentrates quite a lot on um, the late medieval period. It doesn't talk a huge amount about early medieval period. Um, and um, I'd say less... Uh, fair perhaps that it to, to criticize it for concentrating on astronomy because actually astronomy was really the core science of the middle ages uh, and it feeds into so much else it feeds into timekeeping it feeds into astrology it feeds into medicine um, so uh, i would say it, you know a focus on astronomy is essential um, but there are you know criticisms that it is a, a little bit focused but but that partly comes from the way that i structured it around the life of a single individual um, and um and, and that, I felt, was essential to make it manageable. Otherwise, it becomes too much of a textbook. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about the individual, because I, I was really interested in, in the way in which you use John Westwick or John of Westwick as your central figure. Uh, I, I kind of lost sight of the debate about the authorship of, the, of his key work, The Equatory of the Planets, back in the 90s. So, so I, when I came to your book, I was still under the impression that the consensus was that Chaucer wrote that book. And then, uh, and so I was delighted to discover that I was wrong and that it was this other guy. So tell us about John of Westwick, who, by the way, now has a Wikipedia entry, largely thanks to you and your book. So there's an achievement <laughs> for you. Well, I have to confess that I wrote most of that Wikipedia entry. Because <laughs> I thought having, having written the book, I should, I should give him an entry. Um, and, uh, and so if you if you go, I wasn't secretive about it. My username on Wikipedia is Seb Hawk, so <laughs> sort of you can see that I that I wrote most of that. Um, so John Westwick doesn't have or didn't previously have a Wikipedia entry because he's not 
a great man of science, right? And that's part of the point of the book. We can maybe get to that a little bit later about mm -hmm. great man history. But um, the point about him is he's an ordinary guy. He's an everyman. He's a, an ordinary guy who had this incredible adventurous life. So he was a monk of one of the richest abbeys in medieval England, St. Albans, about a day's walk from London. And uh, he didn't stay all his time in the monastery though. Uh, he left St. Albans, probably exiled to go up to Tynemouth, which was the daughter house of St. Albans, right on the North Sea coast, where the monks are constantly complaining about the weather and the terrible food and the shipwrecks and the birds and the sea, everything. They just, monks <laughs> love complaining about stuff. <laughs> so uh, he went up there. He, he probably, we don't know for sure, he probably studied at Oxford University, uh, which was, of course, one of the first universities uh, in England, uh, in the, uh, well, the first university in England and one of the first universities in Europe. Um, and he went on the failed Bishop's Crusade uh, crusade uh, to Flanders, which was part of the Hundred Years' War, um, and where the army besieged a friendly city and then all got dysentery. So it was a, a pretty bad expedition, but um, he had this kind of adventure to the Low Countries, and then he came back, and then we find him 10 years later in 1393 uh, in London designing this astronomical instrument, as you say, the Equitry of the Planets, uh, which exists in a single manuscript in Cambridge. It was discovered in the 1950s by a historian called Derek Price, Derek de Sola Price, who later became famous for reconstructing the Antikythera mechanism, uh, mm -hmm. which is this ancient Greek planetary computer or planetary model. Um, and Price jumped to the conclusion based on the fact that it was written in Middle English and the date was about right uh, and that it mentioned the word Chaucer uh, and mentioned astrolabes. Price jumped to the conclusion that it was written by Chaucer, the great English poet, um, and spent you know, his whole PhD thesis and much of the rest of his career trying to prove that. Um, and as you say, a consensus among kind of historians of science went with Price. A consensus among Chaucerians was kind of against Price because they didn't like the idea uh, that their man Chaucer would have been into something kind of so arcane and astrological. But it is important to note that Chaucer was into astronomy, but that is not in dispute. He wrote a manual for an astrolabe, as you've already mentioned, um, and it's it's still, I mean, it's, it's how I learned to use an astrolabe as well. Uh, so it's still, you know, one of the best guides to using an astrolabe, and you can find a translation of it uh, online. Um, so anybody who's watching this can can go and kind of read it either in the well in the Middle English alongside in the Modern English. Um, and Chaucer was a pioneer of Middle English. Um, but to cut a long story short, uh, a few years ago, a Norwegian scholar named Kari Anna Rand, who's a, a Middle English scholar, a literature scholar, not a historian of science, found a match for the handwriting that showed that this was not written in the hand of Chaucer, as Price had argued, but written in the hand of this monk. John of Westwick, uh, and she identified another manuscript, um, another scientific manuscript in his handwriting, a copy or a kind of edited copy of the works of Richard of Wallingford, the great astronomer who was abbot of St Albans, abbot of John Westwick's monastery uh, a couple of generations before him, a generation before him. And, um, and I identified another manuscript in his hand where, again, he annotated a copy of Richard of Wallingford's works. And I found another manuscript that, that probably is his handwriting as well. So we know that he was kind of active. We know he was interested in manuscripts. We know he was, you know, he was a typical monk in lots of ways. He had this adventurous life, um, but he um, did what monks do. He studied, he read, uh, and of course he prayed. Uh, and, and really my, my book is trying to use his life, first of all, as a kind of a narrative hook. So we learn along with him. We learn about how he would have told time using the stars. We learn about how he would have learned basic uh, arithmetic at the time when Hindu Arabic numerals are starting to replace um, the Roman numerals and how one might multiply using Roman numerals or count to 9,999 on his hands. So how he learned all these things, we learn along with him uh, yeah. and then um, it gives us a little bit of a kind of human interest story to, to balance out some of the hardcore science that hopefully makes it a bit more enjoyable to read. Yeah, look, I think, I think it works. Uh, one of the things that I, I really loved about the book was all the connections that you draw between people. And while you were just talking, um, I was just thinking about some of, the, some of the connections between Chaucer and, and, uh, and Westwick. 
Um, they would have been, he was living in London for a while at around about the time that Chaucer was, uh, was Clark of King's works and, and very active in, in, you know, he's a Londoner. Um, it's tantalizing to think that they may even have known each other, small city, both in, mm. into the same stuff. So that's yeah. a possibility. I mean, one of the problems for anybody trying to argue that uh, Chaucer wasn't the author of the Equitry was that it, it cites Chaucer, it's got Chaucer's name in it. Uh, and this kind of all goes back and forth, because on the one hand, if you cite Chaucer, why would you cite Chaucer with the name Chaucer? Um, <laughs> you wouldn't cite yourself in the third person. You'd say, yeah. my. I mean, no, it, yeah. What he cites is the number of days in 1,392 years. So the number of days in at the end of 1392, the number of days since the incarnation of Christ. Um, so um, that's a kind of a useful astronomical piece of data. Um, but why cite that with Chaucer's name? Um, there's a double argument there, because on the one hand, why cite it with Chaucer's name when it's a fairly trivial piece of information? On the other hand, why cite it in the third person if you're Chaucer? So yeah. neither of them really makes a huge amount of sense. Um, and, and I argue that Westwick probably did know Chaucer and probably did use or maybe didn't know Chaucer, but certainly was aware of Chaucer's work and could well have known Chaucer because London was a fairly small place at the end of the 14th century. Yeah. Um, it's not that, you know, it wasn't the, the it, was a, it was a city, it was big by, by English standards, um, but it clearly wasn't the, the enormous metropolis it is today. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and at the Abbot of St Albans Inn, which is where the, the kind of office of the St Albans Abbey in the city, a kind of um, base for sales and, and a, um, a base for the abbot to stay as well. Um, he might well have had an opportunity to meet Chaucer there, and he had certainly read the treatise on the astrolabe. So there is a kind of a sense of a community, and I think one of the things about medieval London that's really interesting is that there is science happening in these courtly settings, and there's also education, lay education. It's not all being done by the church. Um, so, so it was possible to kind of take an interest in astronomy and in mathematics and astrology without necessarily being at a university. Yeah. And the, the pseudo crusade or the so-called crusade of Hugh Spencer in, in which was actually a complete disaster gets a mention <laughs> in the general prologue of Chaucer. I think the squire is depicted as having as having fought in it in contrast to his father the knight who fought in proper crusades. So there's a nice little bit of Chaucerian humor there. You also mentioned Richard of Wallingford and he's the guy that I usually hold up when I'm trying to get people to understand the sophistication of medieval science, because he was the inventor of a remarkable, well, we call it a clock, but it's a it's a computer, really. Tell us about Richard of Wallingford's clock at St. Albans. Hmm. Yeah, so Richard of Wallingford um, was a, a son of a blacksmith. He grew up in a smithy in, in Wallingford, which is a little bit to the south of Oxford. And um, it seems he was kind of spotted by the prior of Wallingford Priory, which was another daughter house of St Albans. So St Albans is this massive monastery with also these kind of network of daughter houses all over the country. And the prior of Wallingford apparently talent spotted Richard of Wallingford at a young age and um, kind of got him to come into the monastery and then send him to Oxford. And monks um, in the middle of the 14th century. So Richard of Wallingford was born at the end of the 13th century um, and, and he would have attended Oxford um, between uh, I think about 1310 and 1327. Um, and um, monks were increasingly going to university because monasteries wanted their leading brothers, not all of them, but the ones who were gonna have responsibility to be well-educated, partly of course, because they wanted them to understand theology, but also because they wanted them to understand administration and law and so on. So they were, they were learning skills that would be useful to them when they were managing these vast estates, which a lot of monasteries uh, had, certainly big ones like St. Albans. Not all monasteries were very wealthy by any means, but, but certain ones were. But they're also and, in competition, you point out, with the Franciscans and the Dominicans, who yes. were the orders who were really at the forefront of this intellectual, you know, blooming of the 13th and 14th century. So there was a yeah. bit of competition there as well, which I exactly was right. yeah. I never thought about. Yeah, I mean, particularly the Dominicans initially, because they were founded for preaching, right? They were founded to preach against heresy. And in order to be able to preach against heresy, you need to have all the arguments at your fingertips. So mm -hmm. if your heretics are saying 
you know interesting things about the way the world works and that you know god couldn't possibly have created the world because x y and z you know that there are multiple universes or the world is eternal or whatever it might be then you need to have the scientific arguments against that um to uphold catholic orthodoxy so the dominicans are really keen participants in the in the new universities and then the franciscans follow suit pretty quickly um and um and and form these networks and, and take part in the universities. And of course you get famous named Dominicans like Thomas Aquinas or, or um, Albertus Magnus, uh, Albert the Great and Franciscans like uh, Roger Bacon, you know, household names almost uh, are, are the products of these kind of friars interest in universities. But the monks are a bit slower, partly because, you know, they, they at least in principle live cloistered lives in the monastery. So they don't wanna be corrupted by the, the life in the city and let's face it student life in the middle ages was pretty corrupt i mean we know about these riots we know about murders and violence we know about people like trashing pubs and yeah, yeah it's everything that it is today and then some um so so you can understand why the monks kind of steered clear of it initially but then what happened was all of the brightest and best young men were joining the friars and the, uh, the monks realize they're kind of losing out and they're sort of starting to stagnate. And then with the blessing of the papacy, they start sending more and more monks to study at university. Generally speaking, which is kind of why I got into this, generally speaking, they don't go for very long. They just go for a term, they go for a year, they maybe even just go in the vacation uh, when the, um, the masters of the universities are less busy because of course universities are far less organized uh, in those days than they are today so a lot of the time it's just kind of freelance teachers who are happen to be in the same place have kind of formed a union and that union becomes the university the, the words have the same root so um, so Wallingford, Wallingford must have been a, a, a smart kid got got spotted by a, mm -hmm. by a local clergyman went into the monastery was then sent to Oxford because he was very bright because as you say, not every monk uh, was, was selected yeah. to go and, and get that education. But he went back to the monastery after his education? Yeah, so he, he loved it. He clearly loved it. He stayed for as long as he could. And then at a certain point, um, he'd stayed for as long as he was going to be allowed to stay before really committing himself to the monastery, right? Because they're paying for him. It costs a lot to keep a monk in a, mon in a, in a university. Um, and so, you know, universities, sorry, monasteries were really hesitant to let monks stay for very long. Um, because purely because of the price um, and so after a while he goes to St Albans and he takes um, his monastic vows and he passes through the four stages of ordination that you have to to become a fully fledged Benedictine monk um, and, and a priest uh, and then he goes back to Oxford uh, he's kind of said like I'm committed to you now let me finish my degree so he completes his, his course at Oxford he qualifies to lecture um, and during his time at Oxford uh, which really go back to answer your question that you asked about 10 minutes ago. Uh, during his time at Oxford, he writes uh, two really important um, uh, scientific astronomical works, as well as um, some other kind of useful, but perhaps less important stuff. He writes a book, a uh, treatise called The Rectangulus, which is a description of a, of a kind of astronomical calculator uh, to com convert between different kinds of coordinates. So to convert between horizontal coordinates, uh, equatorial coordinates and ecliptic coordinates. So three different kind of ways of viewing the space, a three dimensional space of the heavens, which already is quite complex. Uh, and then his really advanced work was the Albion Treatise, which is a uh, a design for an astronomical computer. So it's a kind of multifunctional device that does everything that an astronomer would want to do. It, it computes uh, trigonometry, spherical trigonometry. It also um, calculates the positions of the planets and it finds the stars. It does everything that any instrument you can think of does. Yeah. And it's just really neatly designed. It's a, it's a really clever geometrical computer. So it, it demonstrates geometry as well as being really useful. Um, and then he, there's a little bit of a kind of story here that he shows up mysteriously at St. Albans just as the abbot dies, the previous <laughs> abbot dies in 1327. So the monks whisper because he's known for being, you know, this scientific genius. He, the monks whisper that maybe he predicted the abbot's death using his astrology, you know, right. because if you're a genius astrologer, surely you can predict something as simple as an abbot dying. So he shows up just in time for the abbot to die. I mean, the more kind of mundane explanation is that um, someone tipped him off, that the abbot was, was on his deathbed and that he quickly hurried. It's not that far from Oxford to St. Albans after all. 
Um, so, uh, so he anyway, he shows up just in time and he gets himself elected abbot, uh, despite not having held any you know, serious office in the, in the abbey. But that kind of shows how much they respected his scientific background and his learning, rather than giving it to somebody who'd kind of worked his way up um, being a prior of a minor priory or something like that. They gave it to Richard of Wallingford. He was abbot only for eight years. He died in 1335 because he had leprosy, probably um, uh, contracted when he went to Avignon to have his appointment confirmed by the, by the Pope, oh. um, which itself is a, an interesting story and uh, is told quite well by John North in his book, God's Clockmaker, yeah. um, which is a biography of Richard of Wallingford. Great book. Uh, but anyway, uh, it is a great book. Um, he, uh, he, he builds this incredible astronomical clock. As you say, it's much, much more than a clock. Um, and he does that in the time, you know, it may not have been absolutely complete by the time he dies, but it is his main project. Uh, Edward III, King of England, uh, who became king in 1327, the same year that uh, Richard of Wallingford became abbot of St Albans, visits the abbey and complains that Richard of Wallingford is spending all his time, energy and money on building this extravagant clock to go in the abbey church and says, why are you not looking after the walls? The walls are crumbling. Um, and Richard of Wallingford, and in fact, there had been not many years before a massive collapse of part of the church. So, you know, it really was in bad repair. Um, and, uh, and Richard of Wallingford says, you know, any abbot can repair the walls. Any abbot can just build some, some simple church walls, but only I can build this clock. So he's, he's kind of arrogant, but he's also, you know, realistic about it uh, because the clock is, is a phenomenal achievement. So, so clocks, mechanical clocks, really accelerated their development. They, they were kind of a creation of the, um, of the late 13th century in terms of understanding the escapement mechanism that allows a clock to beat out equal portions of time. Um, and, and so it, it develops quite rapidly, but what Richard of Wallingford does before anybody else is really, um, or at least anybody else um, in the Middle Ages, is build um, in all of these astronomical tools and devices. So it tells the time in three different ways. It tells the, the, the unequal hours, which are the kind of seasonal hours that change with the seasons, the equal hours, the ones we use today, uh, mean time. And it also tells true time, which changes throughout the year, depending on um, where the earth is in its orbit around the sun and, uh, and the position of the, of the sun uh, over the equator. Um, it, so it, it also it also told them what the tide was at London, and I've never quite worked out why the monks at St Albans would need to know what was high tide at, in, but down in London. Can you explain that? Well, yeah, this is a, um, there's 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 a small amount of um, speculation in this, it has to be said. So um, the the evidence for the fact that it told the tide is that there's a description of the clock, um, which says that it gave us the height of the tide. Um, the clock itself, I have to say, um, doesn't survive. It was destroyed at the um, dissolution of the monasteries in the 16th century, when a lot of the property of the, of the English monasteries was destroyed under Henry Thank VIII. You. Thank you, Henry VIII. Yeah, 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 and destroyed a whole bunch of priceless, um, irretrievable books as well. So yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's a sad moment, certainly. Uh, and um, the clock was destroyed. So what we have is initially all we had were descriptions from people who had seen the clock, which are fairly vague, but they do mention the, the height of tide. And then John North, who I've already mentioned, discovered kind of haphazardly in a, in a manuscript in Oxford, scattered throughout this manuscript, diagrams and uh, descriptions and, and uh, details of how to make this clock, but it's not a complete treatise by any means. Mm. And it seems that some of it was written by Richard of Wallingford himself. Some of it was written by the people who maintained the clock after he died. Some of it was written by the people who finished the clock, but it's not a complete description by any means. So there's a lot that we know was in the clock that isn't contained in this treatise. So there's an element of kind of speculation about precisely how certain parts of it work. And one thing um, that some people have said is that it, it showed the planets. Um, I didn't include that in my book because there's no very strong evidence for that. Oh, okay. um, just that yeah. He intended perhaps to include the planets, but whether he ever managed to do that is another matter. Um, but uh, there is a description that says it had some kind of a tidal 
gauge and there's a um a table in a St Albans manuscript of around the same time which shows the uh, flood tide, the time when the current changes in London. Uh, some have recently had this pointed out to me by an expert in this, that um, despite being a sailor myself, I hadn't actually quite twigged, that the time when the current changes is not the same as the height of tide because it actually carries on moving a little bit afterwards. So um, sailors will know that, you know, they're actually there, there's a slight displacement there. But anyway, it is London as far as we know, but I can't be absolutely sure. So it's a little bit of um, guesswork and joining the dots there. Uh, mm -hmm. But why? I mean, the monks did spend a lot of time in London. Certainly, um, London was a major port. Uh, London was where they would have exported from if they were sending goods overseas. Um, so, you know, if if you wanted to send your goods down to make a boat that was leaving on the on the tide, uh, you would need to know when the when the high tide was. And remember, these monasteries are big businesses as well yeah. as places for people to pray. Yeah. And of course, all that wine that they liked would have come uh, in the <laughs> yes. opposite direction. So if you want to know when your Rhenish pipes of Rhenish wine were coming, then... Uh, That's needs... an incredibly good point. Yes, I always think about the exporting and never about the importing, which is why, <laughs> the, why Britain is in the problem it is today. Um, yeah. But... Um, but yeah, absolutely. If you want to get your carts down to London in time to pick up the imports of wine which have just arrived on the uh, on the on the flood tide, then you need to make sure that they're there in time. Absolutely, that's an excellent point. Very important. Um, you and I could talk about things like that that clock all day. So maybe we should maybe we should move on a little. But I'm just sort of thinking about what you were talking about before about that teleological view, that Whiggish view of history. That history is a matter of progress. And I'm through history for atheists. I'm constantly battling against uh, a, a popular, a series of popular misconceptions about history that that many atheists, particularly the prominent ones, guys like Dawkins and, and Hitchens and Harris and so on, have about history. And they really see the Middle Ages as a period where the church held back progress and and stifled science. Um, many people talk about the burning scientists at the stake, and I always say name one, and they never can. Um, but but just can we maybe just talk about that that standard sort of pseudo historiography that I'm, I'm I'm constantly kind of battling against? What's your what's your reaction? What's your response when people say it was a period where the church held back science, held back progress? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, exactly. You have to put these things in kind of square quotes, don't you? What is progress? What is science? Uh, yeah. And I think that, that these are things that people who understand the period really struggle to define. And certainly the pat definitions, which are based on our assumptions about what counts as progress and our understandings of, of what is defined as science. And bearing in mind that philosophers of science today even now find it impossible to define a pseudoscience, find it impossible to say exactly what makes, um, you know, psychology a science, but astronomy not a science or whatever, <laughs> oh, sorry, astrology, astrology not a science. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta be careful there. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so these things are, are never as simple. I mean, I don't, I'm probably not as extremist as some people in this respect, in that I think extremist, I'm playing into, playing into the hands a little bit here. Um, there, there clearly are times when the church uh, as an organization kind of imposes its um, will on what people should and shouldn't study. Now, if I don't know how much people follow the news in the UK at the moment, we're really struggling with this right now because the government have just come out and said that there are only certain things that people should um, be studying in history and um, they should be studying the great and glorious history of uh, the British Empire and you shouldn't be doing Britain down and if you study you know the bad things that the British Empire did uh, all over the world then you are kind of hating uh, on on British history I paraphrase slightly but um, the point is is to go to show that that authorities have always worried about what people study authorities of all kinds generally speaking the church is a not as powerful as people might imagine in terms of controlling what people can study in the Middle Ages. But more importantly, they're in love with science. They think that science is brilliant because science proves how God works, right? Their job is to understand God. 
And how do you understand God? Well, according to the medieval metaphor, there are two books that you read to understand God. You read the book of scripture, of course, but you also read the book of nature. And if you study creation, if you look around you, then you get to find out how God made the world. And by understanding how God made the world, you understand the mind of God. So they are absolutely committed to understanding how nature works because nature, they think, will lead them to into the mind of God. Now, um, that obviously leads them to ask all kinds of questions about how things work. Um, it doesn't lead them into atheism, of course, because, um, you know, they start from a premise that, that everything is created by God. Um, and I think, you know, but the, the basic point is to say that, you know, yes, you might find a few examples of where um, people were, um, uh, were, were prosecuted for um, pushing beliefs, which seem to us now like science. But actually, if you look at them in their own context, it's much more about the personalities. It's much more about, you know, how they, you know, in the case of some of the famous examples, they're pushing things, um, they're, they're telling theologians how to teach theology uh, and how to make their theology fit. And it's about turf wars. It's about, um, you know, people muscling into what the church said was their domain to teach theology. So, you know, the idea that the church is stifling science is already nonsense. Now, when you start to talk about um, science, you have to kind of say, well, what is science? Um, and uh, science, of course, comes from the Latin word scientia. So it, it has this broad meaning of knowledge, any kind of organized discipline of knowledge. Um, now, if, if people say the church held back the pro progress of science, do they think the church held back the progress of theology? Because theology was a science in the Middle Ages. And if you say, well, no, theology doesn't count as a science, then you're already misunderstanding what it was that people were trying to do. So it, you can't just say, these are the things we're interested in and the church held them back and, and pretend that you're learning anything about history. I mean, mm. it's fine to say that um, the things that we value some of them were valued more in the Middle Ages uh, than, than others, or, or some of the things that we value were not so valued in the Middle Ages. Um, but that doesn't really tell you anything about, about how, how it worked, about how people studied, about how people learned, because fundamentally people in the Middle Ages weren't trying to be like us. So giving them points for how much they're trying to be like us is not a very interesting scientific exercise or historical <laughs> exercise, I should say. Yeah. Um, you know, we can't, and particularly, as people seem to do, to give some kind of moral superiority, to kind of ascribe this sense of righteousness to the ones who seem to us to be a bit like us. It yeah. just makes absolutely no sense at all. And, and that's and that's really what I suppose what I'm referring to when I talk about the weak view of history, where, where there's good guys and bad guys. So Galileo was a good guy because he's doing stuff that's, that we kind of we kind of respect, um, and whereas there are other people who are bad guys. I came across a, a video by a very, very young um, atheist who, who was getting quite uh, quite snotty about this whole topic and disparaged Newton, um, said, well, he did, he did many good things. He said, but he also did all this astrology and, and did all this alchemy and did all this ridiculous biblical stuff. So he wasn't as great as everyone's making out. And I think, as you just said, that fundamentally misunderstands what Newton was doing because it's looking at him on our or particular a particular type of modern terms rather than looking at him on his terms and trying to understand and this is what i'm battling against the whole time with history for atheists is getting people to see the past on its own terms rather than and it's fine people. it's fine to say you know i don't like newton i think i think he's an asshole because he's into <laughs> astrology and i don't think astrology is you know worth anything but it is a personal view and these yeah. people have to be honest that that is their personal view and they're interested in this thing and they're not interested in this other thing and they can't pretend that they're being objective it has to be it can only be a subjective judgment yeah. um and so you know they they need to accept that and they need to accept also that their idea of progress might be something that that doesn't match what would have been in called progress in its day you know we really value scientific and technological progress perhaps we don't value moral progress as much uh, perhaps we don't value um progress in in other areas um and and you know some of the time that that progress in one area comes at the expense of progress in another area and uh you know it, it's um 
it, it's not a really helpful way of looking at history mm. to try and say, how did people become like us? Um, and partly, one thing I've not talked about is it's also not a very helpful way of learning from history. If you think you can learn from history, which some people are skeptical about, and, and yeah. I have sympathy with that view. Um, but if you are trying to learn from history, if you're trying to learn the lessons from history, one of the great lessons from history is that um, in every era, there are um, problems. In every era, um, there are ways ways to improve. But if you only look at, at um, things in the past, and judge them according to how they manage to be like us, then of course we get 100% because we're 100% like us, which means that we become incredibly complacent yeah. about the failings of our own period. So if we say science in the Middle Ages was useless because it's nothing like our science, then we, we lose sight of the things in our science which are actually incredibly lacking and, and, and need improvement. You know, the well-documented crises in peer review, for example, or whatever it might be. Um, yeah. The fact that uh, many of the, the um, things that are well known to be pollutants are still you know, out there in the world because, of course, science is never a pure discipline. Science is done by people and people are fallible. Yeah, it's true. And, and I think you just encapsulated very nicely what the, one of the things that's wrong with the historiographical fallacy of presentism, which is the idea that we are the pinnacle and everyone else is, is, is kind of a failed version of us or, or at least trying to climb up to be like us, which is an incredibly arrogant point of view. But, but as you say, it blinds us to, to what, what's going on around us. I agree with you about the, the difficulty of uh, difficulties involved in learning from history, but I, I, I take your point on that. Uh, and, I, and this is why I suppose returning to your book, why I liked the fact that you chose someone who wasn't, even though he's a very interesting guy, you chose to focus on someone who wasn't one of the great men. And you know, it's interesting contrast with James Hannum's book, where he, it was a succession of sort of potted uh, biographies, which is fine. I think I think you know some of those people are not well known, so I thought that was a very good way of doing it. But I thought your book was a nice sort of contrast, a useful contrast to that. Um, so it, it's been great talking to you. I did, I've asked all my serious questions. I do have a couple of not so serious questions. So first of all, there's a rumor. So is it true that you once compete, competed in a London marathon dressed as a famous London skyscraper? It is true. Uh, I, I ran the 2014 London Marathon dressed as the Gherkin, which uh, at the time was the most famous uh, new uh, skyscraper, I'm not sure it's quite a skyscraper, but anyway, uh, city building, glass and, and, and steel building in London, um, phallic symbol of the city of London. Uh, and I made it entirely out of papier-mâché with the help of my wife. Uh, and I, it was, I was eight foot tall wearing it and I crashed into the uh, gantry over the finish line when I, when I got to the finish. But I did finish uh, and I, I raised money for Parkinson's research uh, doing it. So I, um, as I said to the news team that, that uh, covered it at the time, if people get a laugh out of looking at me looking like an idiot, then I'll be happy. So Because you were doing this for charity, weren't you? What, what was the charity? Uh, it was called the Cure Parkinson's Trust. So my father uh, had Parkinson's for many years. Uh, yeah. And um, and I wanted to raise money for that, so um, I, I'd, run, I'd run the London Marathon a few times previously, and I kind of got to a point where I was like, I need to do something different. So I thought about running in a costume, um, and I, I basically, when people run run the marathon in costume, so London Marathon is a, a big charity event. It's as well as being a serious running competition, it's yeah. also a big charity event. So it raises, I think, I think more money for charity than any single one day annual charity event or something. Um, right. So it's a big event. And, um, uh, and I wanted to take part in that. Uh, but basically when people run the London Marathon for charity, they go one of two ways. They either just basically put a cape on and run in their running gear with a cape, which I think is kind of cheating. It's not really a costume. <laughs> or they go full rhino and dress up as like, you know, in this incredibly bulky rhino costume or whatever it might be. Uh, in which case that just seems too painful and I wasn't going to do that. So I made my own costume in which I could still run at a decent pace. I think I did it in three hours, 25 or something. Um, but... Uh, it was significantly impressive. So I was about eight foot tall in this thing. Um, so uh, it was it was fun. I still have the costume um, and I did once go punting in it. 
um, but I haven't worn it for a few years, so I have no idea if it's if it's still usable or if the mice have got to it at this point. You went, you went punting on the cam dressed as dressed as a gherkin. That's I went punting on the cam. So what happened was my sister, who's a TV producer, came down to make a little promotional video to try and help me with the fundraising, and we put it on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube if you search for like gherkin the movie or something like that. Um, yeah. And um, uh, and so she filmed me in a punt. Uh, punting along these little flat bottom boats for those who are not familiar with Cambridge you push along with a pole because the river is very shallow um, and uh, and so she did that and then somebody um, afterwards got in touch with me and said we're having a charity auction would you mind if you could be one of the lots in the auction and you can offer a punt tour to someone uh, and we'll raise money for charity so I being a kind of you know PhD student with too much time on my hands said yeah sure why not um, and they they said okay and, th and then i didn't hear anything more of it for several months and then later i got this email saying yeah i won you uh when can i have my punt tour what i hadn't figured out is that if you go any kind of distance on the river cam in cambridge you have to go under a bridge there's lots of bridges across the river cam that's how it gets its name um and uh most of those bridges are pretty low so if you want to go under them in a punt even a person of normal height has to crouch right down so that you can get under the bridges because the clearance is sometimes only a couple of feet. I, with this eight foot gherkin costume, really had to kind of do a, like a proper, you know, um, get down as if someone's shooting at me, kind of plant myself prone on the deck to try and, and get under these bridges. So it was a little bit hairy in places, but I did manage it. I That's brilliant. I might, I might need to, when I edit this, I'm, I'll definitely be putting in a photo of you in the costume, but... <laughs> I might link, link to the video as well. Um, a final question. You mentioned that you're a keen sailor, and that really comes through in, in the book as well. Um, but uh, you may be aware, I don't know how old your children are, but TikTok has, has suddenly had a, a burst of interest in sea shanties, uh, one in particular. So what is your favourite sea shanty, and are you prepared to sing it for us? <laughs> Yeah, I I put on my website, didn't I, that I could sing sea shanties, you and uh, now I'm slightly regretting it. Yeah. I think the thing is, singing something to do with singing and sailing that I've always found just go together. You've got the wind in your face; it just everything's out there. It doesn't matter how much noise you make, because there's nobody around. You can just sing at the top of your lungs. So I've always enjoyed singing when I'm sailing, particularly when it's really windy and you're at the helm, you're heeled over, you're kind of battling the wheel a little bit, little bit. And, and it feels kind of natural to just have a sing, to sing your heart out. And then of course, there's been a lot of attention to sea shanties with this TikTok uh, meme, if whatever you call it, you know, this, this has become very fashionable. And some, you know, people have pointed out to me that what I thought were sea shanties are not really shanties in the sense that sea shanties are particular work songs, work right? Song. And yes. I was singing some of those, but there's a difference between a sea song or a foxhole song, um, which is just a song that you sing on the, on, on the deck. Uh, for entertainment and the work songs which have a kind of rhythm to them yeah. um, which uh, are, are designed to kind of aid work and, and I didn't do a huge amount of that because fundamentally most of the sing most of the sailing that I do yes there's a lot of pulling of ropes but not so much team pulling of ropes because you've got winches right if you've got winches you only need one person to pull each rope um, so I was I didn't have it um, but if you would like me to sing I will I will sing you a sea shanty um, which, uh, which uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm slightly tempted. Tell you what, here is one um, from your sort of neck of the woods. I'm not sure actually South Australia. You're not in South Australia, are you? You're in New South Wales. I know the song. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, there we are. I'll give you a little bit of South Australia. In South Australia, I was born. Heave away, haul away. South Australia, round Cape Horn. We're bound for South Australia. Haul away, you're rolling kings to me. Heave away, haul away, all away. Now hear me sing. We're bound for South Australia. <laughs> Fantastic. And that is a sea shanty because it's got the, the hauling bits in it. That so, one is. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A yeah. Work song. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks for the Australian flavor. I wish I had a, a, a tankard of grog, but uh, <laughs> um, as I mentioned, yes. a lot of health. You've got it. I've got, I'm on a health kick, so I'm not drinking. Um, but Seb, look, thank you very much for making your time this evening. Greatly appreciated. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that you are going to be the first guest on the History for Atheists video channel. So you'll have that great honour. Well, thank um, you. I hope you have many more. Yeah, look, I, I, and maybe when you write another book, you can uh, you can come back on the on the show. 
And if I ever get to get on a plane again, I hope to get to the UK one day. So we might have that uh, that grog together sometime yeah. and sing some sea shanties. Absolutely. Yeah, go and look at some astrolabes and manuscripts too. We'd love to do it, absolutely. Okay, so look, on behalf of, of, uh, of me and, and all the viewers, thank you for your time. And everyone, please buy Seb's book. It is fantastic. Thank you, Seb. Cheers. Bye. Thanks very much.